It's estimated that seizures um, will affect about two to three percent of our pet population. There are certain breeds where a higher incidence um, has been shown, and it's less common in cats. Seizures by themselves do not equate to epilepsy. The definition of epilepsy basically implies that there are multiple seizures over a long period of time, or another definition is two or more seizures that occur over a month or more. Seizures are basically the manifestation of excessive electrical activity originating in the cerebral cortex. There's excessive excitation in the brain that leads to seizures, and this can be either due to um, excessive excitatory neurotransmitters or inhibition of the inhibitory neurotransmitters. And what we'll see is the, the medications that treat seizures usually target one of these mechanisms. So seizures are due typically to lesions or insults that originate in the forebrain, which is our cerebrum and our thalamus. Animals with seizures don't typically have cranial nerve deficits because the, most of the cranial nerves originate from the brain stem. So as we kind of go along and talk about some causes of seizures, you can use that to kind of help you localize your lesion. If you do see multiple cranial nerve deficits along with seizures, that can help with some of the differentials. But typically, if we're dealing with an animal with strictly seizures, without cranial nerve deficits and we're dealing with a, a lesion in the forebrain. So the main components of a seizure, there's kind of four main components. We have the prodrome, which can last for quite a long time. This can last for several days. Animals can show different types of activities, but um, they don't all do this, so this isn't always a recognized part. The aura is actually the very beginning of the seizure and it can be very brief. It's always not, um, it's not always recognized either by owners. And then the ictus is the seizure itself, and then we have a post-ictal phase, which can last for sometimes just a few minutes to sometimes even days. The way we talk about seizures are kind of based on the clinical manifestation of it. We have generalized seizures and partial or focal seizures. Generalized seizures, usually involve a loss of consciousness. They can be tonic, tonic-clonic, which is what um, was referred to as grand mal seizures. That term has kind of fallen out of use. They can even include absence seizures where there isn't necessarily convulsive activity. Those types of seizures can be very difficult to recognize, sometimes only able to be proven by something like an EEG. Um, partial or focal seizures, can involve loss of consciousness, but animals can be conscious during these. And they can also, focal seizures can actually progress into generalized seizures. And it used to be thought that generalized tonic-clonic seizures were the most common type of seizures that animals have, and it's now being recognized that partial seizures with secondary generalization are probably the most common. And we see these actually a lot in dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. With more people having videos of their dogs, you can sometimes recognize the, the focal onset that before we didn't always recognize. And most seizures are self-limiting. Some dogs have cluster seizures where that's more than two seizures in a 24-hour period, or status epilepticus where seizure activity is lasting for greater than five minutes. So we can all recognize that this is a seizure. <laughs> Poor boxer dog. This is a, a pretty classic generalized tonic-clonic seizure. May be some autonomic involvement. They may urinate, defecate, not always. So this is a good example of what we consider a simple partial or simple focal seizure. So do focal in the grand, well, whatever you now call grand mal, do they still exhibit the same amount like misfiring in the brain? Or is it well, just that it's focal within the brain as well? Yeah, a focal or partial seizure implies that the electrical activity is just originating from a focal area and it's not involving the both cerebral hemispheres. And this is one of those things that's still a little bit controversial or I'd say up in the air is what what is this? Some people will classify this as a more of a focal seizure, but um, with alteration in consciousness. So some people call this a complex partial seizure. 
And then we have stuff like this that it can be very difficult to prove, is this a seizure, but it's a kind of intermittent, repeatable behavior. And it's, again, it's really hard to prove whether some of these are seizures or these behavioral disorders. Do you treat those? It depends on the case and the owner. Depends on how often it's happening. I mean, if it's happening so often where the clients feel like this is interfering with the dog's daily quality of life, they're, they're not doing their normal things, they, they can't really interact with the dog like they would, then I would, I would attempt treatment. But I feel like treatment is not super successful. We see these, um, what are called idiopathic head tremors, specifically in Dobermans, Boxers, Bulldogs, Labs. I've seen them in some, some pit bulls, so there's, there's different breeds that it can occur in, and they can do this side-to-side -side head shaking or even up and down. Is there a combination which you normally see at like an age window? Not, not that I'm aware of. I've seen it in some older dogs. I've seen it in some really young dogs. Um, I think potentially sometimes anxiety or stress can play a role in these. Um, I've seen some, some dogs have these in the hospital these specific breeds and the owners never noticed this at home. So I think sometimes it, maybe there's an a anxiety component to it, but it, it's not thought to be a seizure activity. And they don't progress beyond this. So it's a, it's a benign condition. It's not known exactly what causes this. Do you ever treat it? No. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't warrant treatment, yeah. And, and I mean, if, if you were to put a dog like this on an anticonvulsant, I think the only way it might help is you're just sedating them a little bit, but uh, it's not, you know, they're not truly seizure activity. So the way we try to classify seizures is based on the manifestation of it. Is this a generalized seizure? Is this a partial seizure with secondary generalization? And then try to categorize it based on the etiology. And the four main categories that we currently try to put things into are idiopathic epilepsy, symptomatic epilepsy, probable symptomatic epilepsy, and reactive seizures. Idiopathic epilepsy is, is often also referred to as primary or inherited epilepsy. The term genetic epilepsy is now used in people. They have gotten away from um, using the term idiopathic epilepsy. Symptomatic epilepsy also used to be called secondary epilepsy in people. It's now called structural or metabolic epilepsy. Probable symptomatic epilepsy is also sometimes referred to as cryptogenic epilepsy, and in people it's now called epilepsy of unknown cause. And we'll kind of go over what, what that um, category and, entails. And then reactive seizures are not truly, these aren't truly epileptics, these are patients that are having seizures secondary to some other, typically a systemic insult like a toxin or hypoglycemia. So idiopathic epilepsy is more common in dogs than, than cats. It's more common in purebred dogs, although any, any type of dog can get idiopathic epilepsy. There are certain breeds where the genetics have been worked out, and we know there's a genet genetic component to it. The age of onset is typically between one and five, although it's being more commonly recognized that some of these breeds can have seizures as early as eight, 10 weeks of age. With, with genetic epilepsy. Most of the time, seizures tend to occur at night or at rest. So oftentimes, you know, in the middle of the night or early in the morning. And initially, they are fairly infrequent, once or twice a month. Occasionally, some dogs present with cluster seizures as their first bout of seizures. That's not super common. Um, and the most important thing about these dogs is they're normal in between seizures. They should not have any um, neurological abnormalities other than seizures or during the postictal period um, in between seizures, they should be normal. Symptomatic epilepsy comprises all those cases that involve structural lesions of the brain, brain tumors, congenital malformations, um, infections, and inf inflammation in the brain. We'll briefly talk about some of these symptomatic um, causes. We could have a, a whole talk on meningoencephalitis, but um, this is something that I think is seen more commonly than a lot of people maybe recognize. I'm always suspicious if I see a young Yorkie or Maltese or Pug that has 
seizures that were, you know, there's, I think, a pretty fair chance that we're dealing with something besides idiopathic epilepsy in these breeds, and it's just really important to look for any other symptoms in these dogs. These are thought to be autoimmune types of diseases in these breeds. The onset is usually young to middle age, so same, same age onset as, as idiopathic epilepsy. The diagnosis can be difficult in that it often involves doing advanced imaging and spinal taps on these patients, and even then, some of them can have normal tests. The survival time is, is really variable. It really just depends on how they respond to, to medication, but some, some of these dogs can actually do quite well. I've had some dogs that have been coming to me almost since we opened and are still being treated and, and have a good quality of life. And then there's some patients that no matter what we do, you know, their signs progress within a matter of weeks to sometimes even faster. Any dog over the age of six years with a sudden onset of seizures, um, brain tumor is going to be a differential in. Dogs have a fairly high incidence of brain tumors. It's estimated to be much higher than what occurs in, in people. The main brain tumors that we see are meningiomas, which tend to occur in older um, dogs like Labs, Goldens, German Shepherds, and gliomas tend to affect brachycephalic breeds more often, and these tend to occur at a younger age. So we certainly see um, our fair share of boxers that are five, six years old with these tumors. The main tumors that we can see metastasize to the brain are mammary and prostatic carcinomas and hemangiosarcomas. So this term probable symptomatic epilepsy is not a, a term that I'm a big fan of. I, I would prefer if we switched over to seizures of unknown cause. But these are patients that they, they don't fit um, within the, the typical sort of um, confines of idiopathic epilepsy. They may have some inner ictal deficits, but yet we can't find out why these patients are seizuring um, through blood work or imaging or CSF tap. Everything's normal, but we know this is not just a genetic um, or inherited type of epilepsy. So these can be patients that have had a history of head trauma and now start to have seizures. So, so sometimes there's a, a possible cause that you can point to, but, but not always. And reactive seizures are, again, the, a, a patient that would have a, a normal, what's thought to be normal brain, but they're reacting to something that's going on systemically. The big thing to ask when you're diagnosing a seizure disorder is, is this a seizure? And obviously, like that boxer that we saw, there's, there's some that are very easy to diagnose. We know that's a seizure. And there's some that are a little bit harder. And there's some where you don't witness it. But it's, if possible, try to get the, the owner to take a video. I think that can be really, really helpful. But things that even, even when you have a video or you witness it yourself, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between a, a syncopal episode, some behavioral changes. Um, acute vestibular events, I would say, are one that um, frequently get confused with seizures. Narcolepsy and cataplexy are pretty rare events. Episodic weakness can sometimes look like a seizure, and, and even episodes of pain. I've had a, a patient that came to me that was actually, it was an epileptic dog, and it'd been having seizures for years, and been pretty well controlled, and the owner was calling saying, the seizures are becoming less controlled, they are happening more frequently, and so I adjusted the, the anticonvulsants, and she kept calling saying that's not helped. So I said, why don't you bring the dog in, let's look at it, and she brought the dog in and it was actually having muscle spasms in its neck from a herniated disc and the dog's head was bobbing and she thought it was a, a seizure. So sometimes other things that owners will call a seizure, you know, it's good to just get the patient in and look at it or get a video. When working up a patient with a seizure, at a minimum a physical and neurological exam should be done as well as a minimum database on a, a patient that's a first-time seizure um, patient, a CBC, a chemistry, and a urinalysis. Depending on the, the signalment of the animal, thyroid panel, um, bile acids, um, infectious disease titers may need to be done. Um, as far as thyroid testing, that's not necessarily done to get a, a cause of the seizures, more so depending on the medication that might be started that could affect 
testing down the road um, and just trying to see are there other systemic things that you need to know about before starting medication. But, but thyroid disease in itself is not going to be a, a cause of seizures. If it's an older patient it's doing thoracic and abdominal imaging, looking for evidence, do we have some sort of neoplasia that's possibly metastasized or infectious diseases? And then ultimately, if we're dealing with a primary intracranial lesion, we might need to do some sort of advanced imaging of the brain or a spinal tap. As far as EEG goes, that's not something that we have available here. It's pretty difficult to do an EEG on, a, on an animal. We did some when I was at the University of Florida. Um, and even in a very cooperative patient, it's, it's very difficult to get a tracing. And so while that's something that occasionally can be offered, it's, it's not a, I'd say, a commonly done thing. Things to look into when a patient comes in for seizures is, you know, how old is this patient? The breed, is there any history of seizures or trauma? Again, what does this event look like? Is there a, you know, a video that would be helpful? Is there any localizing signs before the event? Are there behavioral changes, you know, between the seizures? You know, does this dog seem like they're confused at home? Are they walking in circles? Are they bumping into things? And are they occurring at a certain time of day or associated with exercise? Seizures, again, tend to occur mainly at rest. It's rare for them to occur in association with exercise. So if, if that's the case, I'm always suspicious that we're dealing with something else besides a seizure. So again, specific things to pay attention to on the exam are, you know, are there any cardiac abnormalities? We have enlarged lymph nodes. Is there pain on skull palpation? That's something to look for. Um, is there an open fontanelle? For the neurological exam, it's um, definitely best to do it in between seizures. If a patient's come to you that's just had a seizure, there definitely can be some temporary deficits. So I always try not to do an exam on a patient that's just had a seizure because you can't really rely on any abnormalities that you find. And again, patients with lesions in the forebrain, which is where seizures come from, typically do not have any cranial nerve deficits other than potentially something involving cranial nerve two. This is a chart that just has some clinical signs that vary between a forebrain lesion and a brainstem lesion. So again, they're, they're pretty unique when it comes to lesions involving the, the forebrain, so the cerebrum and the, the thalamus versus the brainstem. And if you do have clinical signs that involve both of these, that can be helpful, again, in, in formulating it some, some differentials. When it comes to looking at the brain, our two main options are CT and MRI. If we're dealing with something like a strongly contrasting, enhancing tumor like this right here, we're gonna see that on a CT. But things that we can certainly miss on a CT are gonna be inflammatory diseases, so different types of encephalitis, strokes can be missed on a CT, and there are even some tumors that we can have a hard time picking up on a CT scan. So while CT can be an option in, in some cases, it's definitely preferred to do an MRI when we're looking for any sort of intracranial lesion, and specifically if we do have signs that are also referable to a brainstem lesion, CT is not a good imaging modality. These images down here kind of demonstrate this is in the brainstem. We get a lot of artifact, these kind of black areas and a lot of streaking that happens when we're looking at the brainstem with CT. So if we are concerned about a multifocal type thing and there's brainstem involvement, C CT is not a, a good choice. So MRI is definitely preferred over CT for any sort of imaging involving the brain. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of a CT and an MRI. So you can see the, just the detail that we get on CT compared to MRI. I mean, the brain just looks very grainy on the CT. You can see the ventricles if they're, again, if we have a large tumor in the brain, we're gonna see that on a CT if it's contrast enhancing. Sometimes if they're not, th those can be actually hard to pick up and there's some that aren't very contrast enhancing. Um, if we're looking for something like hydrocephalus in a, a young puppy, we could pick that up on the CT. The, the CSF is gonna be black. Um, but on MRI, we can pick up much more subtle lesions, things like strokes and inflammation from encephalitis. The other advantage to 
MRI is we image in multiple planes versus CT, all the imaging is done in one plane and then it can be reformatted into other planes but you lose, you definitely lose some detail when you do that. So with MRI, we, we image in multiple planes when we do it. So we can get a good picture of the, the cerebellum here and the brain stem and also before doing any sort of a tap you want to know that there's not partial herniation of the cerebellum from, you know, if you have a big tumor up here, that can cause herniation of the cerebellum, and that's not something that you can really pick up on a CT scan. A big question that I would say I get a lot is, when do we start treatment in dogs with seizures? We don't, I don't want to say we don't, but we don't have um, proven, I guess, guidelines like they do in people. There's definitely in people pretty strict guidelines on when treatment should be started. The, the current recommendations in people are if you have some sort of identified cerebral lesion or a history of trauma, it's recommended in their seizures involved to start treatment. In people, since EEGs are done much more often, if there are interictal EEG abnormalities, um, that's is a very predictive of ongoing seizures and that would indicate that treatment should be started or if there's marked postictal effects. While they haven't shown a benefit to starting treatment after one seizure in people, it has been shown that the earlier in the course of the disease treatment is started, the more likely it is that you'll be successful in treating seizures. So recently there was a, um, a consensus statement that was put together by a group of neurologists that kind of went over the current literature and recommendations in regards to the available anticonvulsants and they put together a list of guidelines on when should we treat in regards to dogs. And their current recommendation was if there are two seizure events within six months, if there's been any episode of cluster seizures or static epilepticus, even if it's one event, if there's an identifiable lesion in the brain or a history of a prior brain injury, or there's prolonged, severe, and un unusual postictal period. But I think it's nice that there's something that has been, you know, a group of neurologists worked on and put out there. Um, I don't necessarily follow these exactly. Um, it really depends on the patient. If I have a dog that's having a seizure every six months, but they're otherwise normal, I'm probably not going to treat them. But I do warn people that, you know, if that goes on for a long time and then the seizures start to become more frequent, possibly we might be a little less successful in getting those under control. But I don't necessarily treat them when they're that far apart. I do recommend treatment if a, a dog has had an episode of cluster seizures, for sure, or status epilepticus. In dogs, if we know they have a brain tumor and they've had a seizure, I always put them on treatment. If I have had some patients where we identified a, a brain tumor and they've not had a seizure. I don't always put those patients on anticonvulsants. It partly depends on what their symptoms are. If we have a patient that's already kind of obtunded or dull, but they're not having seizures, I don't necessarily always put them on an anticonvulsant because I don't want to contribute to that. But if they've had a seizure and we know they have a brain tumor, I would start them on an anticonvulsant. As far as the unusual or prolonged postictal period, I've not necessarily used that as a guideline to treat seizures unless it's involving aggression. Um, then I would. I've had some dogs that have had um, been aggressive during their postictal period, and, and I would be more aggressive in starting an anticonvulsant in those dogs. When we start treatment, Ideally, we want to try to decrease the frequency of the seizures and the severity of them, but also try to balance the side effects of the medication. So I always tell people, you know, we want to know that there's a clear benefit to treating these seizures. So if the medication ends up being worse than the seizures, then I don't think there's a clear benefit. So you're going to have to find that balance. The other thing to educate your clients about, and especially in the beginning before treatment has started, is up to about a third of dogs, despite appropriate treatment, will not be controlled. And this is mainly talking about idiopathic epilepsy. I think a lot of people don't understand that and they expect their dog to become seizure free when we put them on medication. And most of the time that's not the case. So I always try to, you know, make sure they know about that in the beginning. We're trying to 
reduce the seizures to what is considered acceptable, and that's different for every person. Some people are okay with their dog having a seizure, you know, every other week, and other people, if their dog has a seizure twice a year, you know, that's a big deal, and that's not okay by them. I typically start with one drug and try to max out that one drug before adding on another drug. So it's, I think, always easier to know if that drug worked rather than having to, you know, go backwards if you don't get to max out that drug. You also want to make sure that you're not really evaluating whether that drug is working until it's reached steady state. So we'll go over that with the individual drugs, but, a, you know, for, for instance, a drug like potassium bromide, that's going to take three to four months to reach steady state. So I always tell people when you're starting a drug that takes a long time to reach steady state, that that time doesn't really count when we're trying to evaluate if the, the drug is working. When you're looking at a paper that's written about seizure medication, a positive treatment response is defined as a 50% or greater reduction in seizure activity. So that depends on what patients are evaluating. If they're you know, looking at dogs that are having a seizure, you know, four seizures a month, which a lot of these papers are, they go down to two seizures a month, they consider that a positive response to treatment. So you have to take that into account when you're looking at some of the, the research on the anticonvulsants. Starting a patient on an anticonvulsant often also involves doing some, some drug monitoring. When you're doing that, it's important to try to avoid using serum separator tubes as the silicone gel will bind the drug and give you a falsely lower level. So it's important to not use those. Um, it's also good to know what is the half-life of this drug. Um, it takes about four to five, five half-lives before steady state's reached, and that's when you want to do your um, check your drug level. Other times to consider checking a drug, drug level is after there's been a dose change. If there's been another drug that's added on, that may affect the metabolism of the drug. Drug level might need to be checked. If there's been a diet change, this, this is kind of specific to potassium bromide, that could certainly affect drug levels. Um, or a systemic disease that might affect the metabolism of the drug. Um, if the, the dog's seizures become less controlled, then a drug level should be checked. The common drugs, I don't want to say common, but some, the, the drug levels that are available are mainly for phenobarbital, bromide, Keppra, and zonisamide. And these prices are through the pharmacology lab at Auburn. These are the, the cost to you, so not the cost to the client. Um, this is the cheapest place I have found to have drug levels checked. They also offer um, shipping labels that are about 50% the cost of typical shipping that you can print out and ship stuff in. So I know sometimes it's hard to get people to do some of these because of the cost, but this is a way to do it for a little bit less. And it's also nice if you send stuff here because they'll give you a, um, depending on the drug, they'll kind of give you treatment recommendations. Uh, and if the patient's not well controlled, how, how you should adjust the dose. For phenobarbital and bromide, because the half-lives are fairly long, we typically just check one sample. For drugs like Keppra and Zonisamide that have shorter half-lives, a peak and a trough are recommended. If you're only going to check one sample, it's recommended to do a trough. So you'll need to check it right before the next dose. All right, so we'll start with phenobarbital, which is I'm sure everyone's familiar with. The initial dose is two to three mg per kg twice a day. It can be given as a loading dose if you need to um, have effectiveness sooner because this drug takes about two weeks to reach steady state and become effective. The common side effects are ataxia, sedation, PUPD, polyphagia. These are usually most pronounced when you first start the drug, although they can persist um, while the, the entire time the animal's on this. Hepatotoxicity, of course, is, is possible with phenobarbital and been shown to be more likely if their level is over 35. We can see, instead of sedation, actually hyperexcitability. I found this to be pretty uncommon, but I have seen it. We can see some bone marrow changes and uh, dermatitis. These are, these are very rare. Phenobarbital is metabolized by the liver and it does cause induction of different enzymes. So there's a lot of drug interactions with phenobarbital to be aware of. So anytime you're not sure if you have a patient on phenobarbital and they need a different medication, I always look it up because there's a huge list 
of drugs that are affected by phenobarbital. And it actually induces its basically its own metabolism, so over time you often have to increase the dose to maintain the same level. And while it does increase liver enzymes, that does not imply hepatotoxicity. I get questions about that um, quite often. And with the, you know, the liver enzymes arising, I need to take this patient off phenobarbital, and, and that can be an expected finding. It's sometimes more about the trend are the liver enzymes continuing to rise over time? How high are they? But we can see them go up, you know, the ALP seven times normal, and that doesn't imply always that there's hepatotoxicity. When dogs are taking this medication, I typically recommend the CBC chemistry, plus or minus the bile acids and a phenobarbital level two to three times, or, or excuse me, once to twice a year. Sometimes a phenobarbital level may need to be done more often if the dog is not well controlled. The advantages to this is that this drug has been around for a long time and it's probably one of the most effective drugs that we have for controlling seizures. It's historically been very cheap. Um, that's changed a little bit. Some of the tablet sizes have gotten quite expensive. Um, we'll, we'll talk, actually I think it's on the chart. Some of the other tablet sizes are, are still quite cheap. The quarter grain and half grain and one grain tablets have gotten quite expensive. We've actually um, stopped carrying those because they got so expensive and now are doing the 15 and the 30 and the 60 milligram and those are still pretty cheap. Because of the half-life, this is a drug that can be given twice a day and it does need to be given twice a day to be effective. I've had several patients come in who are getting it once a day or getting a different dose in the morning versus in the nighttime. And if you give it that way, it's never gonna reach um, a true steady state. The dose is gonna fluctuate a lot, so I don't recommend that. It does work faster than potassium bromide. So if that's another drug that you're using commonly, the phenobarbital at least works a lot faster than that. The downsides to it are there are a lot of side effects with phenobarbital. It does require therapeutic drug monitoring to make sure that the drug is safe. I don't think it's, um, you have a client who's not gonna be able to check levels, I think there's other drugs that you can use besides this. If you're gonna use phenobarbital, I think you need to check levels. Again, there's a lot of drug interactions with this drug and it will affect your thyroid levels. So you, it's essentially impossible to truly diagnose a dog with hypothyroidism while they're on phenobarbital because it can cause a lower total T4, a free T4, and it can increase your TSH. So essentially you don't have a, a good way to diagnose it just based on clinical signs and that's difficult too because a lot of these dogs on phenobarbital, you know, they're overweight, they can be kind of lethargic, so it's, it's hard to differentiate if they truly have hypothyroidism. And this is also a controlled substance. So potassium bromide has also been around for a long time. There's some anecdotal sort of reports that this may be a good choice for patients that have cluster seizures. I've never found the exact reason for this. This was something that my mentors kind of instilled in me when I was in my residency. And one thought behind it is because it has such a long half-life and there's so little fluctuation of this um, once they reach steady state, that um, that may be better for dogs that do have cluster seizures. The dose is 30 to 40 mg per kg per day. It has an extremely long half-life, so this does take three to four months to reach steady state. So it can be loaded if you need it to become effective a little bit faster, but loading it does not actually achieve a steady state. It just it helps to get the drug into their system a little faster. And the side effects are fairly similar to phenobarbital. It causes PUPD, polyphagia, sedation, but the, the biggest difference is this has no hepatic metabolism. So this is an alternative in animals that have liver disease and, and cannot take phenobarbital. It is not recommended for use in cats due to they can get um, a bronchitis or pneumonitis type condition that is reportedly irreverse, or reversible if the drug is stopped, but it can be fatal. So again, bromide is eliminated completely by the kidneys. It does not cause kidney problems, but if you have a patient that has renal problems, you may have to reduce the dose of bromide. The half-life in dogs, again, is 
21 to 24 days. So, you know, multiply that by four to five to get your steady state. Because of the way this drug is eliminated, it is important to maintain a cons consistent diet when animals are on this. It doesn't have to be a specific diet. It's just important for owners to understand that if they change the diet, that may affect the elimination of bromide. So if you go to a diet that's higher in salt, then you're gonna cause more bromide to be eliminated and the levels could drop versus if suddenly they go to a low salt diet, then you may have more retention of bromide. Another thing I've also found that a lot of clients won't tell you what kind of treats they're, they're giving and that can sometimes make a difference too. Monitoring is, is similar to with bromide, or excuse me, with phenobarbital. A, C, a CBC chemistry and a bromide level are recommended once to twice a year. The um, toxic condition associated with excess bromide is called bromism, and I've seen this a few times. It's pretty rare, but it, the signs can be very severe. So with excess bromide, dogs can actually um, become stuporous or even comatose. They can be blind. They can be paretic. That can be paraparetic or tetraparetic, and they can even have depressed spinal reflexes. Megasophagus is a reported possible side effect of excess bromide levels. And the treatment for this is stopping the drug, and if the signs are severe, diuresis. So giving them um, fluids will help eliminate the bromide faster because the half-life, again, is so long that when you stop the drug, it takes a really long time for this to get out of their system. There is an injectable form of bromide. It's called sodium bromide. I have never used this but it is an option that's out there. The, it has a higher bromide content, so the dose is a little bit lower than, than the oral um, potassium bromide. The good things about bromide are it's also thought to be a very effective anticonvulsant. It's been used for a long time. It's fairly inexpensive. It does not affect the liver, and it can be dosed once a day. This is pretty much the only anticonvulsant we have that can be dosed once a day. Do you want to always try it 24 hours apart? It's not that important because the half-life is so long. So this is one of those drugs where maybe if you have a client who's you know, not super compliant, this may be a good option for them. If they miss a dose here and there, it's actually not a big deal. The downsides to this drug are the side effects. It has to be compounded. You do need to check levels with this as well. And it takes a really long time to reach steady state. So Valium as a anticonvulsant um, works by affecting GABA in the brain and the half-life is extremely short in dogs. And you'll see some of the other newer anticonvulsants that I mentioned also have a similarly short half-life, but they are thought to be suitable as a maintenance anticonvulsant, whereas I do not consider Valium a suitable maintenance anticonvulsant in the dog because of the short half-life. If you were to use this drug effectively, you would have to give it every, at a minimum every six hours. And the other thing that happens with oral Valium is dogs are thought to develop a tolerance to it quite quickly. So this is not a great anticonvulsant for dogs. It is possible to use this as an anticonvulsant in cats. Um, there is the risk of hepatic necrosis. But this is an option, I guess, that you have. It's not something that I typically use. So again, this is not an effective oral anticonvulsant for dogs due to the short duration of action and tolerance that develops. The other downside if you were to use this is this may actually prevent using Valium in an emergency treatment for dogs. And there is cross tolerance between different benzodiazepines, so it's not, um, so even if you're using a different benzodiazepine as your anticonvulsant, it still pot potentially could make Valium less effective in the dog for emergency treatment. So when do we use some of the other drugs that we're about to talk about? Um, there's lots of different reasons why you might use them. If you have poor seizure control with phenobarbital and potassium bromide, you want to lessen the side effects of those drugs or just try to avoid them altogether. If the levels of the potassium bromide or phenobarbital are too high and yet your patient's not controlled, you may need to think about a different anticonvulsant. I use them a lot 
if I have a patient that has altered mental status, so if I have a patient that has a brain tumor and they're a little bit dull already, I try to avoid the use of phenobarbital or potassium bromide because they're potentially going to make that worse. And if you have an animal that has some concurrent disease that's already making them PUPD and then you put them on phenobarbital or potassium bromide, you're also going to make that worse. So the first drug we're going to talk about is Keppra. The initial dose of this is 20 mg per kg three times a day. So this drug has to be used three times a day. If you have a client who cannot give it three times a day, don't use it. I feel like you're wasting their time and their money giving it twice a day. This drug has a very unique mechanism of action, which is nice if you want to add it on or you have a dog that's not controlled by something like phenobarbital or potassium bromide, possibly this might work for them because it just works very differently. The half-life, as you see, is short, but it's thought that this drug works longer than what the half-life suggests. So that's why it can be used three times a day and it's thought to be effective. It works immediately because the half-life is so short. There is no real time to steady state. It's, it's actually not thought that Keppra actually truly ever reaches a steady state where there's no true accumulation of the drug over time. And the side effects are little to none. You might see some mild sedation, possibly some ataxia, but it's usually very mild. This drug is very safe. It does not affect the liver. And in safety studies that were done, dogs were given 1,200 mg per kg per day for a year with minimal side effects. So I don't hesitate to increase the dose. If the 20 mg per kg dose is not effective, I'll double it or triple it. And usually, we rather than seeing side effects, the reason we usually don't go higher is either just cost um, or the owner just can't give that many tablets. Because the drug is so safe, I do not check levels of this drug. Um, in people, they're not routinely checked. The few times I've checked it is when owners were just concerned it wasn't working and we wanted to see, is the dog even absorbing it? But we weren't checking it for um, toxicity. There is an extended release formula available, which can be given twice a day. So this is an alternative for people who can't do three time a day dosing but you really want to use this drug because of minimal side effects. The dosing of this is 30 mg per kg twice a day, and that's a starting dose, so you can go up from there. The tablet sizes are 500 and 750 milligrams, and they cannot be split because these are extended release tablets. If you split them, then they no longer are extended release. So if you do the calculation, basically the smallest dog you can use this in is about a 35 pound dog. So this is not something you can use in your small dogs, unfortunately. This is mainly just for bigger dogs. One of the things we can see with this is what's called ghost tablets. I've had several clients whose dogs are on this that have called me saying they're seeing the whole tablets pass in their feces and so they're concerned that they're not absorbing it. And this is a phenomenon that you can see with extended release medication where the medication is absorbed through micropores on the tablet and the tablet can actually look like it's intact even once it's passed. So I always warn clients that they might see that and that is okay with this. And you can check, check drug levels if you want to prove that they're absorbing it. I've done that for one client who was very concerned. Her dog wasn't getting the medication, um, but I just tell them that that's an expected thing and usually they're okay with that. There's a little bit more potential for sedation with this than regular Keppra. The advantages to Keppra are the side effects, which again are pretty minimal. It has a very different mechanism of action. It works immediately. It does not affect the liver. It can be used in the emergency treatment of seizures. We keep this injectably here and use it a lot for dogs that come in seizuring. And there's some thought, although there's not a lot of research on this, but that it may have some neuroprotective effects in dogs with seizures and some anti-kindling effects. The downside is the regular Keppra, of course, is three times a day. The effectiveness of this is just not proven. It's not been around long enough. Um, I do feel like, personally, this is not as effective as phenobarbital or potassium bromide as a first-line drug. I have plenty of patients that I start on this. I don't have any statistics to give you, but I feel like I have more patients that are on Keppra as a sole drug where I end up having to add on something else. The, it's a little bit more costly than phenobarbital 
it's still I, in your chart. I think I put a price for like a 25 kg dog. It's still not bad. I definitely tell people to shop around. There's quite a difference in cost between pharmacies. <coughs> and the extended release is generic. It's something that is I'd say somewhat affordable. just depends on the size of the dog. If you have a really, really big dog, then no matter what you put them on, it's going to be expensive. Typically, if we're giving it for a dog that's actively seizuring, 60 mg per kg we'll give them initially, and then usually follow up with 20 mg per kg doses every eight hours. And we try to switch them over to oral as soon as we can. So nisamide is a drug that I like a lot. This is actually, I'd say, my first go-to now as a maintenance anticonvulsant. And the reason is it seems to be effective and we don't have nearly as much information on this as we do on phenobarbital or bromide. But I have a lot of dogs that are on this as a sole drug, and it seems very effective and has much less side effects typically than phenobarbital or potassium bromide. If you're using it by itself or you're using it with Keppra or um, potassium bromide, you can start out at five mg per kg twice a day. If you're using it with phenobarbital, you have to actually use a higher dose. The half-life in dogs allows this drug to reach steady state in about three to four days. So it's also nice that it works a little bit faster than phenobarbital and certainly a lot faster than potassium bromide. The half-life in cats is actually a good bit longer, so you can use this drug once a day in cats, which is really nice. I've used it in several cats, and it's nice to have a drug that you can give once a day in cats. The side effects... Again, it can cause some sedation, some ataxia. Oftentimes that's transient, and same thing with some GI upset. You might see that in the first two or three days, and then oftentimes it'll resolve on its own. It is a sulfonamide derivative, so there is potential for some idiosyncratic reactions. They're thought to be extremely rare with this drug. Um, I put KCS as a possible thing. It's, again, thought to be extremely rare. And same thing with um, effects on thyroid function. This drug has some liver um, metabolism, but the chance of hepatotoxicity is, is very low. I still check a CBC and a chemistry um, every 6 to 12 months, but I don't check drug levels with this drug. We've had some dogs we've checked um, where their levels are you know, at the very high end of what's reported in people, and they're not showing any side effects. And we don't actually have true, um, a true reference range to use in dogs. We just extrapolate from people. The good things about this drug are, again, the side effects are minimal. It works pretty quickly, and there's less risk of hepatotoxicity than with phenobarbital. The downside are the cost in giant breeds. This drug seems comparable in price to phenobarbital, maybe just a little bit more. It's actually cost-wise pretty reasonable. Definitely, again, tell people to shop around as far as cost goes. And the, the other thing I've run into is because the biggest size it comes in is 100 milligrams, if you have you know, a 100-pound dog and you're giving them this, you, know, you might be giving them five capsules twice a day. I mean, that's a lot. So cost-wise, that's still, it still may be reasonable, but just the amount of capsules. So that's the, the other downside in a large dog. Gabapentin is another option we have as a maintenance anticonvulsant. There's quite a big dose range, and it has to be dosed at a minimum three times a day. The half-life is quite short. So some people actually suggest dosing it four times a day, which I've never done. This is a drug I would say that maybe... I reach for if a dog's already on two or three anticonvulsants, they're not quite as controlled as I'd like, and cost-wise, you know, we need to pick something else that's pretty cheap. This is pretty cheap, so it, it can be effective as an add-on drug, um, but it's definitely not a good sole or first-line anticonvulsant. The side effects are pretty minimal, so it, it is nice in that respect. And if you're using this, I use gabapentin much more often for pain control than I do for seizures. But just as a word of caution, there is a liquid formula available through human pharmacies, but it is reported to contain xylitol, so I don't use that. So the good things about this drug are pretty minimal side effects. We don't need to do drug monitoring on it. It's pretty cheap. The downside to it is if you're going to use it as an anticonvulsant, you need to give it three times a day, and it's not thought to be as effective. 
So another drug we have that is kind of similar to gabapentin, but thought to be a little bit more potent, is pregabalin. And this drug has a little bit of a longer half-life than gabapentin, so it can be dosed twice a day. There was a, a paper where they looked at this drug and they found that starting at a 2 mg per kg dose twice a day could be effective, but you can go up to 4 mg per kg up to three times a day. So some dogs ended up being on this drug three times a day, um, but there is the potential to use this drug twice a day. The side effects are pretty similar to gabapentin. The possibility of sedation is a little bit higher than with gabapentin. And certainly if you started at the high end of the dose, you'd probably see quite a bit of sedation. So it's definitely recommended to start at the two mg per kg dose and then work your way up if needed. So the good things about this drug is it's another twice a day drug that you have available. Side effects are minimal. The downside is this is still very costly. It's not yet generic and it is also a controlled substance. I have found Wedgwood will compound this. I'm not sure exactly the, the legality of that, but um, I have had this compounded for some small dogs and it actually wasn't that bad. I think I put a cost in the chart for a bigger dog I mean, it's not completely unreasonable to use. Another drug that we have available that I've used a few times, I don't have a ton of experience with this um, drug, but is topiramate. And this drug is suggested to be used. Again, this is a suggestion because we don't have a lot of or, uh, research on this. Is 5 to 10 mg per kg, 2 to 3 times a day. The half-life is quite short, but again, this drug is thought to exert its effectiveness longer than what just the half-life suggests. It can, it's thought to be pretty well tolerated and cause some sedation and ataxia and weight loss. This drug is actually, I believe, now being marketed in people as a diet, a diet drug. So, so those, those fat epileptic dogs out there might be a good choice. <laughs> So with this drug, the benefits of it are, it, it seems to be very well tolerated. It um, is very cheap, it is generic. Even for a big dog, you can usually put them on this for probably $30 or under a month, so it's, a, it's cheap. Um, the downside to it is we have just very limited information on this drug. It can be used in cats. Um, I have had a, one cat patient that is taking this currently. There's a few other Anticonvulsants that you may have heard of or ones that may be coming out. The one on the top, Pexion, is being used pretty commonly in Europe and Australia just within the past few years. It's not yet approved here in the United States and I'm, I'm not sure why. It's, I believe, was used, I think UT actually did some clinical work with this and used it in some um, a clinical trial, but we don't have it available yet, but it's a twice a day drug. It's thought to have similar efficacy to phenobarbital, but less side effects. So the only thing I could not find on this drug was cost. So that I have no idea. But that might be something that you hear about maybe coming out. It just became available in Australia in 2015, and in Europe I think they've been using it for a little bit longer than that. Felbamate is another anticonvulsant that was thought to be potentially a promising drug in dogs. It's used in people, and due to some side effects in people, it's become used much less, and so because of that, the cost has skyrocketed. So at one point, it wasn't that expensive, but it's now really expensive, and it is a three-time-a-day drug. I've personally never used this drug. I've had a patient come to me that was on this drug, and I can tell you it was not cheap, and I'm not sure why it was being used, but. The Lamotrigine is something that I put up here. Potentially, I've had some um, physicians come in and ask about, you know, can I use this drug in my dog? This is used in people, and um, one of the things that, you know, if we're not familiar with the drug, I don't recommend using it, because this drug was found that the metabolites um, were cardiotoxic. So just because it's safe in a person does not mean it's going to be safe in, in our, our patients. Tegretol is another anticonvulsant used in people that is thought to have too short of a half-life to use in dogs, but I think that's, that's the same thing was thought about topiramate, that it, this half-life is too short to use in dogs, and they've you know, found that it potentially is still effective. So there's a chance that something like this could, you know, if someone studies it and finds that maybe it is effective. So when it comes to 
switching anticonvulsants, I get this question a lot on how do we how do we switch over, how do we add on a drug? And it's important to know what's what's the half life of the drugs you're using and that'll help you when you're trying to add on or switch a drug. So if you have a patient that's on a drug like phenobarbital or potassium bromide and you have to take them off of it for some reason and you're starting a new drug, you need to know how long does this new drug take to reach steady state. So you need to have them on this other drug until that drug reaches steady state before you try to decrease the other drug unless it's an emergency. So if you are switching, let's say, from phenobarbital to potassium bromide, I mean, that potassium bromide is going to take three to four months. So you need to you know, wait that long before you start to decrease the phenobarbital. But with some of the newer anticonvulsants, they're going to start to work much faster. So you can start to then get them off the, the other drug. I mean, if it's an emergency, if a dog is in liver failure and you need to stop phenobarbital abruptly, you can. And then, in which case, it'd be better to start an anticonvulsant that's going to have a faster onset of action. If I am taking a patient off of an anticonvulsant, um, I try to drop it down by about a quarter percent, if possible, every few weeks. Depending on the drug, if it's something like zonisamide and its capsule, it's not always possible to, to you know, drop it quite that way. But you try to wean them off. The only drug that you don't need to wean is potassium bromide. When you stop that, you can just stop it. The half-life is so long that it weans itself. One of the um, kind of, I'd say, disappointing but interesting things that I learned recently at a conference, we had a human neurologist come and speak on um, seizures and people and some of the, the different treatments. And one of the statistics that they reported was that in people, about half of them respond to the first drug you choose. It doesn't matter what drug you choose, as long as you're using something that's thought to be effective. Um, if, but if they don't respond to the first drug, your chance of them responding to the second drug is only about 13%. Beyond that, the percentage drops. So not that there's no chance that if they don't respond to the first drug, you know, they're not going to respond to the second drug. It's just with each drug that you're having to add on, the chance of you getting control of seizures becomes less and less. So your first opportunity is the first drug you pick. So I recommend trying to, you know, pick a drug that you think is going to work and use it appropriately. One thing that we don't really think about in our patients, um, especially when it comes to something like treating seizures, is the placebo effect. And I sometimes talk to clients about this. Um, there, there is a, a placebo effect that was shown recently in a study that they did looking at dogs being treated for seizures. Um, in a placebo um, controlled trial and they actually found that up to almost a third of the dogs had a placebo effect when, when doing a, a, a trial. It's not known exactly why that happens but that's that's something that I think you have to, the big thing is just to recognize that that does occur and if you're, you know, there's a new anticonvulsant coming out and you're, you know, looking at the studies on it and they report, you know, a 40% response rate, well, that may sound decent, but it may not be as good as it actually sounds. Why do some dogs not respond to, to medication? You know, there's, there's different reasons. I'd say one of the more common reasons is they are not giving the drug appropriately, whether it wasn't prescribed appropriately or the dose is not appropriate or just the, um, the owner themselves have, you know, they're not following instructions. They take it upon themselves to give the drug less frequently or change the dose. There's progression of an underlying condition that either wasn't recognized or even, you know, was known about, but it's it's getting worse. And again, owner compliance is a big one. And up to half of people who have epilepsy report not taking their own meds like they're supposed to. So, you know, when the owner is responsible for giving dogs their medications, I know I'm not super compliant with giving my, my own pets their, their, me their medications. And then drug interactions can potentially play a role. With drugs like potassium bromide, dietary changes can certainly play a role. There is the potential development of tolerance over time, and the patient just may not respond to that particular medication. And then another thing to think about if you have a patient that's just not responding at all is, are these truly seizures or are they something else? I get asked the question occasionally is, you know, once my dog starts treatment, are they gonna be on this for the rest of their life or are we potentially gonna be able to take them off? There is a possibility that some dogs can be um, be taken off a of medication and remain seizure free. 
in people that are seizure free for two years on medication, the majority of them remain that way when they come off. We don't have this sort of information in dogs to know how long they need to be seizure free before they, they come off of meds. But I think it's reasonable if they're seizure free for one or two years to wean them off. I would just do it very slowly. I mean, if the dog's doing really well, the owners have no problems giving medications, there's no you know, adverse side effects, you know, most of the time I wouldn't take them off, but if, you know, if they are seizure free for a long period and the owners want to try, you can, I think it's reasonable to try. So status epilepticus, we'll talk briefly about treatment of that, um, is when we have continuous seizure activity lasting for at least five minutes. In the initial stage of this, what we typically see is hypertension, hyperglycemia, and hyperthermia. But then after, if there's continuous seizure activity for 30 minutes or more, then we can start to see the opposite, where we can see hypotension and hypoglycemia. If a patient presents with status epilepticus as their initial presentation, um, a toxin is one of the more likely things that would cause this, but it can be seen in cases of even idiopathic epilepsy. There was a, a paper that looked at patients that suffered idiopathic epilepsy and whether or not that shortened their lifespan, and it was shown that dogs that had bouts of status epilepticus on average lived three years less than dogs that never suffered from status epilepticus. So our typical first-line treatment is going to be a drug like Valium. If you have IV access, that's going to be the, the recommended way to give it. If not, it can be given rectally or even intranasally, but the dose is double or more what you would give IV. Another option is to give Keppra IV. Again, we typically give it 60 mg per kg IV, and it has an immediate onset. Phenobarbital can also be given, but it's not going to work immediately. Um, so, but you can give this with the hope that you'll get, con you know, you start to get control and then that'll lead to a little bit longer term control. Valium or midazolam CRIs can be used. Keppra can actually, um, excuse me, not Keppra, Propofol um, can be given as a bolus and then as a CRI if needed. Pentobarbital can be used. I have not used this in a long time, <laughs> um, but that is an option. You can put these patients under general anesthesia if nothing else is working, and even ketamine is a, is a possible option that you can use. I have not personally ever had to go to that. I've not had a patient that we couldn't get controlled um, with at least propofol if we had to. For at-home treatment of patients that suffer cluster seizures, um, we do have a few options. You can send home injectable Valium to be given rectally or intranasally. Oral Valium is not a great option for patients with cluster seizures. I don't think it's very effective. And I don't send home rectal volume to every seizure patient. I only send them home to patients that have had recurrent bouts of cluster seizures where they end up, you know, here in the hospital and, you know, they're spending a lot of money coming into the hospital and, you know, we're trying to just help them keep the, that patient out of the hospital. And if you're going to send it home, you need to do it appropriately. So I don't send it home pre-drawn up in a plastic syringe. Um, it loses its efficacy. It needs to be sent home in a glass vial, whether that's the original vial it came in or a different vial. We keep um, some of the dark colored glass vials on hand. We have the little adapter tops where we don't have to send home any needles. You can just um, use a syringe and um, usually I'll send home enough for at least three doses. That's how much you can give in a 24 hour period. Another option for patients that have bouts of cluster seizures is to use Keppra as pulse therapy if they're not already on it as their maintenance drug. So you can give 30 mg per kg three times a day at the first seizure and you continue that until they're seizure free for 24 hours. So again, this is for patients that aren't already on Keppra. Um, but they did a study looking at this and found that dogs that received Keppra pulse therapy had half as many seizures per cluster as they did um, before being on Keppra. So this is, this is an option. Sub-Q Keppra is also effective. So if you have you know, a client who's maybe a physician or a nurse or you, know, you trust with a needle, um, you could potentially send them home with Keppra that they could actually give. Um, Sub-Q. Ocular compression is something that can be done in an emergency situation that has been shown to, through pressing on the eyes, it stimulates the vagus nerve and can help disrupt seizure activity. This is very temporary. 
as soon as you stop, it's going to restart, but this is a, a potential emergency treatment. And then clorazepate or clonazepam um, have a little bit longer duration of action than Valium as far as when given orally. So this is a potential treatment um, for cluster seizures. So again, not a long-term maintenance anticonvulsant because they will develop tolerance, but something that can be given for bouts of cluster seizures. Other benzodiazepines that can be given are lorazepam or midazolam, and these can be given intranasally. Um, but not rectally. Both of these have been shown that they, um, they are not effective when given rectally, but they can be given intranasally. So that's another option for emergency treatment or at-home treatment. Briefly talk about seizures in cats. Um, they definitely occur, it seems like, much less commonly than in dogs. One thing that's kind of unique about cats is they seem to suffer from a lot of different types of seizures. I feel like more than what we see in dogs. They have a lot of atypical type of seizures. I um, feel like we see more focal seizures in cats than we do in dogs. Idiopathic epilepsy is thought to be less common in cats, although there's kind of still some debate about that. The average age in cats to have an onset of epilepsy is three and a half years. For symptomatic epilepsy, it's eight years. Again, cats can have some pretty different types of seizures. I've seen some cats where they'll have seizures where they you know, can start hissing or their pupils become very dilated. You know, they certainly can have the classic tonic-clonic seizures as well. And just like in dogs, there's a lot of different causes of seizures. We're not going to talk about those tonight. As far as treatment goes, most of the drugs are pretty similar other than potassium bromide, which again, I don't recommend using in cats. Phenobarbital, the dose is very similar. Keppra is the same as in dogs. Um, zonisamide can be used once a day in cats, which is a nice option. And then um, gabapentin, pregabalin, and topiramate are all thought to be safe to use in cats at similar doses to dogs. Seizures in, in young animals. Um, we don't see that, I'd say, super commonly, but it's actually thought that um, the immature brain is more prone to seizures. But the good thing about that is it's also more resistant to damage from seizures. In animals that are under a year of age, they tend to be more likely to have seizures due to a symptomatic cause or reactive seizures, things like hypoglycemia, um, portosystemic shunts. As far as treating them, the treatment is, is pretty similar. There's not a lot of information in treating animals for seizures under a month of age, um, but it's thought that once they reach four to six weeks of age, they can be treated very similar to um, the same dosages that you'd use in an adult animal. So if you're treating, if you have to treat an animal that's younger than that, I would probably go a little bit lower on your dosages, um, but then once they, they hit four to six weeks of age, they should be able to take the same, the same dose. Other treatments for seizures include things like surgery. It's not been commonly used for dogs. Um, there have been some reports of doing a corpus callosum transection in dogs, which basically prevents the seizure activity from becoming generalized, but it does not prevent um, a seizure from starting. It just then doesn't have the ability to spread. In people, they of course are doing surgeries where they can localize the, the start of the seizure and be able to resect certain parts of the, the brain to, to prevent the onset of the seizure. We are nowhere near that in dogs, although there is, I don't know where they're possibly out of Virginia Tech, there's somewhere where they're currently doing some research where they're doing implantable EEG electrodes on the brain in dogs to try to try to see if they can localize the source of seizures in dogs to where one day possibly surgery could be an option for these refractory patients that don't respond to medication. Vagal nerve stimulation is a treatment that has been studied in a few dogs. This is, um, it's a device that's similar to a pacemaker that's implanted um, in the sub-Q tissues of the neck and an electrode is then um, basically wrapped around the vagus nerve. And it's been found that stimulation of the vagus nerve can disrupt um, electrical activity in the brain. And so there was actually a study done, I can't remember how many dogs were in it, but they put these devices in dogs that were considered to be refractory epileptics and they found that 
when compared to controls, over the course of the study, there was no change in seizure frequency, but towards the end of the study, they did show a reduction in seizures in dogs that had these in. And what's been found in people with these is that the longer these are used, the more effective they become. So they postulized that this potentially could be effective in dogs. They just didn't use it long enough in the study to get to that point. But these are currently, the last time I looked, about $12,000 a device. So <laughs> definitely not something that is going to be commonly used at any point. Um, but the, the benefit to them, um, if price-wise they were to come down, is you know, there's really no side effects. They can be used with medication. We don't have to worry about compliance. You know, it's not the sort of thing where, you know, you're going to miss dosages. Um, so as far as acupuncture goes, in people there's really no um, evidence that it's really effective. And we just don't, I'd say the same thing in dogs. We just don't have a lot of information. You know, there's no real good controlled studies that have shown a benefit. I've certainly had some clients who have tried it and if, you know, nothing else is working um, or if, you know, they don't want to do medications, I say why not, but I always tell people I just I don't know if it's effective. I get quite a few people asking about diets and you know certainly in children there's a lot of evidence for, for certain types of epilepsy that a ketogenic diet can help. And there was a study done in dogs where they fed them um, a ketogenic diet, so it was high in fat, low in carbs, and moderate protein. And what they found was that dogs are very resistant to developing ketosis. And the other thing they found was that about a third of the dogs in the trial developed pancreatitis. So do not recommend this. And the other thing was they found no benefit um, in seizure control. There is, however, a diet that is about to come out um, that is a medium chain triglyceride-based diet. There was a study that was done actually in Europe. Um, it was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded crossover clinical study in dogs with epilepsy. And they found that after three months on this diet that there was a 70, that 71% of them had decreased seizures with about half of them having at least a 50% or greater reduction in the amount of seizures that they had. And a small percentage even became seizure free. So this diet is Purina NeuroCare. It's supposedly going to be available next month. It's also marketed for dogs with cognitive dysfunction. I believe this is the same diet that was Purina Bright Minds. I don't know if they've changed it up or reformulated it, but I think they're rebranding it and bringing it back out as Purina NeuroCare. So you might get some questions about this. There was a study also done looking at omega-3 fatty acid supplementation. They actually showed there was no, no real benefit to this in dogs with seizures. And then lastly, we'll end on this. <laughs> I've had a few questions, not too many actually, about this yet. Um, but I'd say at this point, you know, we just don't have a lot of information. You know, we know that um, cannabidiol, which is one of the components of marijuana, has anticonvulsant effects. It's not known exactly how this works. Um, it's been studied some in rats and mice. It just hasn't truly been studied in dogs. Um, we know that THC has been shown to have a pro-convulsant effect. Um, so it is important when you're talking about this, you know, what exactly are you talking about? And in people, there's been some trials that have been done where they've shown, you know, some of them have shown some improvement and others have not. So even in people, the jury is still, you know, still out as far as how effective is this. Any questions? Yes. So I heard about the diazepam and caps when you get orally. Uh -huh. So is it the same for the injectable tube? I think it is. Um, as far as the risk of... Yeah, I mean, we still, if a cat comes in and they're seizuring, we're still going to give them Valium. But I think there is that potential risk. You know, I remember as a, like as a student or resident, you know, sometimes wanting to give cats Valium for appetite stimulation, and that was always like the debate, you know, well, there's that risk of hepatic necrosis, and it's, you know, one of those things where it's just, it's very rare, but it's just not predictable. But we, yeah, we're still going to give them, if they come in and they're seizuring, they're going to get Valium.